Hello everybody and welcome to the Pretty Good Gaming Podcast, episode number 54. Hello, I'm Chris E Podcast Pimp Pimdeg Pedros. You might have noticed that something is a little bit different today. Firstly, I'm here joined by wherever he is in the in the world somewhere, Mr. Henry. I'm at home today. Cooper. Hello there. Uh, I am wearing trousers, but they're not not very real trousers. They're just pajamas. But I've got fluffy <laughs> we'll socks take, on. Hey, I'll take your word for that one. <laughs> I can't actually see you. We can't see each other. Nope. We're just talking here. But you can hopefully, through the powers of editing, you can see both of our faces and hear our crisp, clean audio. Um, because we're having to jump through hoops for certain uh, Peroni Plague related reasons. <laughs> <laughs> That we are, uh, yeah, we are working from home remotely today, um, and it will be for the foreseeable. So a little bit of a, you know, bit of a change for the channel. We're going to see how we we run, being able to um, do this from home, right? Yeah, we'll see how it goes. Uh, so yeah, hopefully, if you do see any technical issues like the camera going off here or there or low quality video, we're doing our best we can, given how very short notice this is. And we've had to just you know throw together some sort of video for this week, and hopefully going forward, we can try and improve incrementally. Um, you know, for this duration, how, well, how good these videos can turn out, because uh, we might have bad video this week, we might improve it next week, or the audio issues. I've got some backups on the audio, so hopefully uh, there won't be an issue anyway. Um, but. Um, the lineup, other than that, for this week's podcast, it's going to have to be a short one today for other reasons, um, because this space is being used by my kids to do their remote schooling. <laughs> it's all a bit of a fun. There's so much going on. I, I'm, I'm surprised I'm even able to string a sentence together. But the rest of this podcast will include, um, we'll be looking at the specs comparison from the PS5 to Xbox Series X from what was announced in the last few days. Henry will be talking about dreams. He's been... Dreaming a lot recently, Dreaming right? Dreaming a lot, yep. Not too uh, many we'll nightmares. Take... Not too many nightmares, hopefully. Mm. Uh, podcast questions from the patrons after that. Triggered fanboy comment of the week, if we can scrape one together. Uh, YouTube comments after that. And then the bad dad joke of the week to round up the podcast. So this podcast has to finish in around 45 minutes time. That is the time schedule we're on because the kids have got... Um, I've actually got uh, school lessons that they have to do in this very room, <laughs> remotely uh, to the to the school. It's quite uh, it's quite um, decent technology. The fact that they can like live stream to their yeah. uh, to the classes and be able to conduct a lesson while the teachers are doing it, which they're going to be doing for the next six six weeks or however long it's going to take for this thing to blow over. So um, that's good. They're gonna they're gonna not go stupid over this time. They're gonna get their <laughs> lessons in. Or you might uh, go hopefully. stupid listening to us uh, chat some bollocks about video games, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and, and talking about um, sticking to topic and being concise, let's move on. Um, so, Mark Cerny bored us all to death with the specs announcement of the <laughs> PS5 yesterday. Um, if you're watching on Sunday, it might have been a few days ago now. Um, but yeah, he came out with a bunch of stuff. So, um, not the not the announcement we wanted we were waiting for ages for some ps5 news and it was just a bunch of details wasn't it yeah like well i mean it did say that it was going to be a talk with you know lead system architect mark cerny and he's going to explain the system design and all that but for your first In public showing of what uh, the ps5 is supposed to be reeling off a bunch of system mechanics and dynamics and and hardware and software and all that isn't really the best way to go about it well it's not for the gamers this was yeah. originally for supposed to be first, a gdc you know, talk off. yeah it was supposed to be originally a talk at the gdc which has been cancelled so they've had to kind of re reinvent the you know how they deliver this information which is done on a live stream and it, it wasn't for the gamers really no. it was for the tech nerds it yeah. was for the it's for um, developers, design isn't it? the yeah. game designers the developers right who, who want to know what the hardware is going to be like they've probably already got hands on the testing kits let's be honest anyway but um this was more of a pitch to them than to us so let's just run through the comparisons of the you know for anybody who's considering what the difference is between xbox series x and the ps5 will be i've kind of done my very best to sum this up i'll go through each of the um components and we'll take a look so the cpu is an eight um there's eight core zen x <laughs> i've already <laughs> fucked up uh, eight cores 3.5 gigahertz frequency custom zen 2 um cpu and that is a little lower in frequency than the Xbox Series X with a 3.8 gigahertz. So that's a, a bit of a difference out out of the box. However, the PS4 
four, five, get that number One right, is, is a variable frequency, whereas the Xbox is fixed. And this is all to do with power and how much, um, how much the power is going to stay consistent as it's delivered to this um, chip. But the, the frequency at which it um, operates is going to vary, whereas the Xbox isn't. What that difference that means to me, n- nothing really. <laughs> Someone even commented on the video about it saying, uh, you should just leave Gaz to handle the tech stuff because every time you're like, I don't know what that means. I'm like, yeah, he just fucking doesn't know either. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Give me more credit than I than do there. Yeah. So, so next, the GPU again. Um, so we've got 36 compute units at 2.23 gigahertz, 1.29 gigawatts. Yep. Uh, again, another variable um, rate, so that can change. Uh, so a total of 10.28 teraflops. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, so again, you know, teraflop age apparently isn't as important as Microsoft are making out, obviously, because theirs is bigger. Um, <laughs> but it's not, it's not that important. The custom RDNA2 is relating to uh, the ray tracing and stuff like that. Apparently, that's what that means. Um, that Because that's there. It means that they can do all the ray tracing and fancy lighting and shit like that. So on paper, these numbers are bigger on the Xbox Series X. Uh, it's got a more powerful processor and um, graphics chip, apparently. Yeah. And it has more teraflops. And it, it's clear now from Mark Cini talking that teraflops aren't all made the same. Uh, <laughs> because... M- Microsoft are saying uh, that, you know, we've got this, this amount of teraflops and really it's a lot of bullshit to quote uh, Metal Shot from the, <laughs> from the Discord. Our resident um, uh, tech consultant. Tech expert. Oh, I've got some quotes from Metal Shot. We'll, um, we'll read them out. Well, what his surmise, uh, comparison of these two um, specs are uh, in due course. But according to Mark Cerny, the PlayStation 5 compute units have 62% more transistors, which means would make it equivalent to 56 PS4 compute units. That's the um, So although it's only got 36 CUs, it's equivalent to 56 CUs from the PS4 because that's how much like bigger they are and i mean that's that's what how it seems in my head 62 percent more transistors um and considering it's a huge marketing thing for microsoft to to flop their teraflops all yep. over the place it really isn't as oppressive as they're trying to make out well it's like microsoft is saying yeah we've got a really big dick and then sony are like yeah but we've got really big balls what are you gonna do so it's just yeah, we, apples we and oranges this, that we, this has already gone downhill i mean yeah, i'm glad my kids aren't in in the room while i'm recording this that's for sure anyway um, so yeah, we talked about the ray tracing. Let's move on to the memory. So both they both have 16 gigabytes of GDDR6, according to it says GDDR5 here, but uh, I think I'm reading from the website that isn't Digital Foundry, and they probably know what's going on. So I'm going to go with GDDR, GDDR6. That uh, has to be where it is because that's what Digital Foundry said. Um, two five six bit bit bus, whatever that means. Again, I I'm not an expert on that. Memory bandwidth is different on these two consoles. So four four eight is the bandwidth on the memory in the PS five, whereas the Xbox Series X, um, strangely, has two different bandwidths depending on. So they've got ten gigabytes of bandwidth, ten gigabytes of um, memory at five hundred and sixty gigabytes a second bandwidth and then six gigabytes at 336 gigabytes that's a lot of gigabytes and a lot of uh, different numbers but that just means that um it's it's all standard same speed on the ps5 whereas there's two different speeds on the xbox series x which i don't know um from a what that means from a developer's point of view maybe that's uh, more difficult to maybe that's easier i don't know how that's going to affect them at all um, but that's how it is. And then we move on to the biggest marketing push in terms of what um, Mark Cerny was talking about and the PlayStation 5 is pushing. And this is this um, SSD storage. Now, yep. there was a big thing about um, how powerful this is. And it is really impressive. From my limited understanding, I'm a PC game. I know what an SSD and how what the benefits that brings. But the speed on this thing is phenomenal, apparently. And this is like almost technology. This is... This is where, like, the conversations um, when it comes between P- why go PC versus um, versus consoles. Well, consoles are outdated technology. Well, this is an area where the technology is almost cutting edge for um, PlayStation Five, right? Because it's so fast. Yeah. Now, the the speed at which it can access the information off this 
SSD. Obviously, they've, they've made like a custom um, um, thing. All this, <laughs> yeah, it, it's all customized, right? Yeah. So to, to, in order to harness the speed of this SSD, the, the whole chipset. So which means that it can access two gigabytes of data in 0 0.27 seconds. That is phenomenal. So two seconds, it can access 16 gigabytes of data. And if you think that if it, games these days are like 100 gigabytes and they're huge and they get ages to download, that might take like 10 seconds <laughs> to, 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 to access whatever data it needs, right? Yeah. That will never happen in a game, right? You only need a certain amount of data when you're access a new area like they talked about um, no loading screens or fast traveling um, or when you die you're instantly back into the action and that's what they're aiming for that's, that's the um, ps5 philosophy yeah it's more it's more about the experience from what i see rather than the short sheer numbers that microsoft are trying to push out oh look how many teraflops we've got a place that sony really seems to be focusing in on the experience and what it's going to be like how quick it's going to be to the um to the user yeah, and the thing is, uh, SSDs have been very common in the PC space for ages now. Like, So a lot of people are, oh, your big selling points in SSD, PCs have that for ages. But Cerny made a point to be like, well, if you see our SSD on the shelf in a few years' time or whatever, that's because we made it and we worked with uh, AMD or whoever it is. It's not AMD making it and then putting it in our system. We collaborated and curated it together, and then they'll take it and put it in PC hardware. Yeah, and this is going to have uh, huge implications on g game development, right? Yeah. So being able to access, you know, there's no loading screens when you're in an elevator or squeezing through small gaps, you know, to slow the pace of the game down so, so it loads in. Basically, this SSD can access information so fast, it acts almost like RAM, right? And that was such a limiting factor in the previous generation. And what they're targeting for this next generation on the PlayStation 5 is that this isn't going to be a limiting factor at all. And things can just come at you as quickly as you can. You need them, essentially, which is, which is fantastic. They've also both got expandable storage slots. Um, however, the, the technology isn't quite there to support this, uh, it on the same par with the SSD native to the uh, PlayStation 5. So that apparently they said, don't go buying your SSD slot um, cards yet because the, uh, give, it, give it a few months, wait until the end of the year, and maybe you'll have some SSDs fast enough to keep up with what's in the PS5. Yeah. That's how kind of cutting edge this um, technology is looking at the moment. Um, so... Obviously, they both support external storage too, so you can store your games on a hard disk, H, uh, a regular drive, right? But then, if you want to play it, you're best off sticking it on, you know, swapping the location from a slower drive to the quick drive on the PlayStation Five. And that's might what might be a, a best solution for people who want to keep all their games downloaded rather than keep re-downloading them all the time, because SSD uh, SSDs are very expensive in terms of using it just for long-term storage. Um, so that is it. Backwards compatibility was a thing that they mentioned too. Oh, but before I go to that, like just the comparison, like I mentioned earlier, Metal Shark was, um, he is our resident like tech expert on the yeah. Discord. And this is his comparison. And this is how to, um, how he sees the difference between these two um, sy uh, systems on paper at least. And he says, quote, easiest way to explain is that PS5 is going to be faster at smaller games. So 18 to 16 multiplayer, two player, four player and single player with smaller worlds. Xbox One X is going to have power for larger games, but won't be able to push as hard in smaller titles. So oversimplify, think of it as a motorbike versus an articulated lorry. PS5 is a motorbike. And he said, if I want to play Wipeout, at 120 FPS, I'd pick a PS5. I want to play Fallout 4 with a huge settlement. I'd play an I'd pick an Xbox Series One X. Now that is what we. I mean, that's the general consensus of how they're going to perform based on these this information. How it uh, performs in real life, we don't really know what. It's, it's, it's going to be a wait and see kind of thing. We have to get our hands on the games to be able to compare these two because we can only guess as to the real life. Um, impact of this tech on our games. Um, so yeah, just to just to summarise, that um, Sony have more custom built their architecture um, uh, for this this thing. Although they might not have much as much power, the way that they use what they've got is a little bit more efficient. Um, it seems than Microsoft. 
Um, so yeah, we um, touched on backwards compatibility. Now, people are a little bit c are confused around uh, what Mark certainly said because he mentioned that, oh, I tried almost all of the top 100 uh, most played games on their PlayStation 4 and they they almost all work or something like that. Yeah. Which led many people to believe that there's only going to be 100 games available for backwards compatibility. And so I think that what is most likely is that he's, to, he's, he's just using that as an example and um, there's going to be more um, support for all the games on the PS4 to be backwards compatible as time goes on. So yeah. they just have to check every version of the game because it's different hardware. They just need to check that it runs smoothly on the new hardware before they can rubber stamp it and say, yeah, this is backwards compatible. Um, and I, I would assume that among that 100, among those top 100 most played games, there's going to be all of the exclusives. I, I mean, I can't know that for sure, but I would imagine that's probably the oh, case. Oh, absolutely, yeah. you, you got to like, think the Spider-Man God of War yeah. and them. Um, they're going to be running sweet as hell on the new system, that's for sure. And then the um, the last thing was that the audio, that one of the biggest things, and he went on for ages. And for the people who were interested in that, it's like, wow, this is really exciting, especially for audio engineers, the people yeah. who put the time, who work on the audio in games. I'm sure they're really excited about this. But to me, I it's like, yeah, okay, I'm going to hear things a little bit nicer. <laughs> Like, awesome. you know, I'm a musician. <laughs> I, I'm a musician, right? And I'm a guy who who appreciates good sound quality, but not to the degree that he wants to talk about it. He talked about like mapping the internal di um, dimensions of your yeah. ears in order to, for it to sound like like it's really there, and like having all these uh, different sound sources rather than just the stereo thing. I'm like, yeah, that's 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 beautiful. Like, how the how's the game gonna play? <laughs> and at one point, he was like, well, it's gonna work with inbuilt TV speakers. I'm like great i would have ex expected that to be really? the case and then yeah. Yeah, there's going to be simulated three-dimensional sound and then if you're wearing earphones or headphones it's going to do this and like but don't games already do this like uh, you could you're just pushing it even further and i get that they're excited about it and he did make a big deal about this is going to be our like future thing in our in our dreams or whatever he called it uh, and how ray tracing is really important for audio but not many not many games really use it, but on PS5, right. they were going to be all about that. Well, I mean, I'm sure, you know, we're, we're downplaying it a little bit here, but I'm sure it's really, in, really, yeah. really is uh, a Just big goes thing over in it. terms of experience. I mean, yeah, it depends how you play your games at the end of the day. If you haven't got headphones on and you're playing on a TV screen, it's not going to be a, you know, a big deal anyway. But for games like Hellblade, you know, who, oh, who yeah. do try and tap into, you know, he did use that 3D audio effect. Uh, thing, then you know, for the immersive type games, it's going to make a, a huge bit of difference, that's for sure. So that is it. Um, we'll have to just wait and see what the both systems will look like um, in terms of how they play the games, because you can only look at gigabytes and terabytes and teraflops and all this, and it really doesn't mean a lot to most majority of gamers. But I mean, I've done my best to kind of round up what the differences are here. But it, they're both going to play games. Um, pretty well. They're both a, a huge upgrade from the previous generations of games, and it's just going to be a litmus test. You're going to have to wait and see how the games play out. And if, like, metal, metal, like Metal Shark said, one might be good at certain things like large, having large areas, uh, the articulated lorry comparison, and then there's like PS5, the motorbike that can go blisteringly fast yeah. and just deliver loads of stuff at you. Uh, this um, you know, second by second. So there you, there you have it. That's my um, kind of bit of a roundup on on that, a bit of a comparison. Um, should we move on quickly? Speaking of dreams, yeah. right? Um, so, and talking about PS4 exclusives and how important the games will be on these different platforms. I've been playing Dreams a lot, which is a PS4 exclusive. Uh, and that's the latest game by Media Molecule, and they're probably best known for Little Big Planet, which is on PS3. Uh, so it came out in February, I think. And it's less of a game and it's more just like a collection or a suite of creative tools and like shareable assets because you can make stuff, then share it to other people, then they can make stuff with your stuff, essentially. Um, and it does have, I'm trying to go through this really quick, it does have a single player mode type thing, but it's only about two hours long and the purpose of it is to show you what what you can create in Dreams, like what, what is potentially possible if you... Um, if you have the talent or the expertise or whatever. So that is called Arts Dream, and it's made entirely in Dreams with Dream-created assets and whatnot by the developers. So 
again, while it is possible to make it, they do have professional development experience, so that's certainly an advantage. Uh, and it's about a jazz musician who quits his band, and then his life begins to kind of spiral downhill, so he's got to figure out a way to crawl back and find his passion for jazz music again. He's a double bass player. Um, and a lot of the music in it is really good, so whoever made that, uh, well done. Um, and it's kind of a mix of three different worlds slash genres kind of thing. So it's, there's an action platformer with these two kind of lovable cartoony mascot type characters it's in a similar vein to your Crash Bandicoots and your Spyros and your Son of the Hedgehogs and whatever then there's one which is like a sci-fi puzzle game where you're this little robot and you've got a electrify panels so then you can move up and down elevators and stuff like that then there's the point and click sort of narrative driven adventure part of it where you play as Art um, the main character from Art Stream and that even has like dialogue choices and stuff which is really interesting uh, fully voiced and everything um, but yeah that's very much meant to be like a taster of what the what the game is capable of, and it is it is good fun little little um, two hour experience. But the, the game doesn't end there. The whole point of it is that any game can be made in dreams. Anything from shooters to RPGs to racing games to puzzle games to narrative walking sims and all that kind of stuff, and then beyond. And not necessarily game stuff. Although my camera is now having a go at me, telling me that I'm running out of storage, so this isn't going very well visually. Oh well, I'll fix that in post. Um, so there's two parts of the game mainly. There's dream surfing and dream shaping. Surfing is basically playing other people's stuff and exploring what other people have created. Then dream shaping is making your own stuff. Now, I'm not the... Like, I like to think of myself as a creative person and have good ideas and whatnot, but uh, I'm not very good at actually realizing them. So I've been doing a lot more surfing than I have been creating. And I found some really good stuff. So a lot of it's, you know, very, very work in progress and... You know, there's, there's work to be done, but there's some stuff which is really, really impressive. There's one game called Heroes of Aldrinor by a user called Darkest Essence, and that's basically a proper little fantasy RPG. I'm going to try and put some little gameplay bits at the bottom so you can see what um, what these games are. Uh, and there's three playable characters, and you can play as each one, and they all play differently. There's Vince the Knight, who's like a sword and shield, tanky, high health kind of guy. Tristana the Sorceress, who uses magic spells like fire and lightning. And then there's Garvin the Rogue, who is an elf, I think, and he uses daggers and uses like stealth and whatnot. It does say co-op, but I haven't actually tried that. Uh, but if it can do it, that's like even more impressive. Uh, and it, it has really solid uh, combat. You know, everyone feels slightly different. They will play slightly differently. Solid animation and pretty decent writing. There's no voice acting or anything. It's just uh, text boxes and, and occasional grunts from people you kill. Uh, but that was really impressive in terms of that's exactly the kind of game I would kind of like want to make. It would probably be like a fantasy RPG type thing. Then there was a game called Pilgrim by Narvik, Narvik Guten, I think, which is like an action-adventure game, and this was really impressive. You play as this little wizard, and your job is to just to climb this tower, and the tower kind of unfolds literally around you, and there's bridges that uh, form as you're walking on them and, and whatnot. Uh, that has actual progression. Like, you unlock new abilities as you go through the tower, like a lightning and fire spells. So you can cool. shoot lightning from your staff, or you can do a little poof dash. I love a good poof in a game. And then, <laughs> yeah, there's no other way to put it. Um, I mean, each to their own. That's all I'm saying. It takes all kinds. Uh, and then, like, partway through, it just completely changes genre. And it's like, well, you've just been doing a little action platformer adventure thing. Now we're going to turn you into a top-down twin-stick shooter. And then shortly after that, it changes again to a 2D platformer. <laughs> so, uh that's t showing off a bunch of different things this this creator can do and then it even says uh, on the thing it's been updated and now says now with a secret ending so that he's continually you know adding stuff to it which is awesome I think my favourite one so far is a game called Ruckus though Ruckus Just Another Natural Disaster by Heart Factory and a bunch of other people collaborate on it the concept of that is you basically Godzilla or a kaiju kind of massive monster and you just smash the fuck out of a city it's simple and effective and it's is really good at what it does like all of the environment is fully destructible you can smash all the buildings by punching them whipping your tail at them you can climb them you can jump on them you can eat stuff like boats and you can fire fire laser beams sharks with freaking laser beams there are not enough laser beams in games these days i've always Ex said that exactly There's the poverty of laser games an academic essay by henry cooper <laughs> um then there's another one um called Mimo or Mimo, I don't know how you say it, Prophecy by uh, Razorbacks Vi. And again, that's an RPG and it's got a very like Goonies or Stranger Things-esque vibe to it about like a group of friends investigating a mystery and then 
something uh, something shocking some is going to be uncovered in this little small town type thing um so there's a cast of five characters and they're all sort of you know your, your stereotypes like there's the jock there's the kind of alternative one there's the the girl who fancies the guy but he doesn't know what's going on there's also a dog which is great and reminds me of the famous five and you can pet the dog um which is like as an actual mechanic which is awesome i mean that means that the game's amazing already if you can pet the dog um it even has side quests and again this was this is very kind of basic but you have the option to then go do an extra thing and get get uh, get items like health items or whatever as you go on and that that one's won some of the awards in what they i think media molecule calls them the impies which is like their own little awards thing for best narrative best game in this genre best game in that genre or whatever um but another one I really liked, which is massively just Sekiro, but recreated in Dreams, and it's called Akoni, Akau, Akauni, which means Red Demon in Japanese, apparently. And it's it's that it's it's just Sekiro. You you play as this girl in a red dress with a sword, and you fight goblins and skeletons. You got a light attack, a heavy attack, a dodge block, and a parry, and then there's some health pickups and and whatnot. But that's just again, it's it's simple in what it is and what it's trying to do, which is just make like a melee combat game where you parry a lot, but it does that very well there's another one which i've talked about before on one of the earlier videos called blade gunner uh, by jimmy jules 153 and that's this is the one where the guy actually got a job offer based on this creation and again it's very simple in what it is you're a 2d plane or spaceship or whatever flying around in a circle shooting enemies and and you know unlocking new weapons because there's progression in it which is again really really impressive which it has its own in-game shop where you like you earn currency through playing or xp or whatever and you can buy new stuff so those are just some of my favorite ones that I've played so far, but I've played loads of different things. Um, and those are just the games. There's a bunch of other in- interactive things or just art. Yeah, experiences. Yeah. That, that there's not a lot of gameplay. It's just be in a world and have a look around at something interesting. So there's an animation called uh, Rabbit and Boy by Cyber, Cyber Sheep Films. And it's, it's just like a trailer. It's only like a minute or two long. And it's basically The Last of Us, but with a giant rabbit. Um... And that sounds a bit goofy, but it's... It looks good, though, right? Yeah, it, it's got a decent, like, production value behind it. Like, it's fully voiced. Some of it was obviously a bit wonky because everyone's an amateur in this game. But it's very serious and very confident in its tone about being so serious and very, and, and trying to be like The Last of Us. Because, like, the trailer is you're running away from these people. I think they're humans. So you're, you're animals and you're running away from humans and someone get, your boy gets hurt. So you've got to pick him up and it's very Joel and Ellie kind of, kind of mm. vibe to it. Oh, now my And it's seen through, the, it's seen through the perspective of the person who's been hurt, right? So Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so it, there's a camera down there and it's m- makes it a bit more emotional. Like you can feel what this, um, what this little kid is, is going for or whatever. There's another one which I've seen before and it, and it can be so impressive because there's nothing else to it. It's just like a diorama, like an art piece. And it's Wolverine from X-Men, uh, which means because it's just a diorama, they don't have to worry about mechanics or anything else taking up system resources. So they can just put everything into making it look and sound visually impressive. Uh, and it's basically just Wolverine leaping out of an explosion. And it is incredibly detailed. You can see like little folds and crinkles in his costume or even like bits of shrapnel Jam- jammed into his back and like pockets on his outfit and he's even got like spit and slobber coming out of his his mouth when he's like screaming and everything's got like texture because he's got his beard on uh, mutton chops as usual but there's little little details to show that okay this stuff is like a leathery type thing and this isn't this is this i just think it's awesome and i i've always liked diorama stuff in video games like the batman arkham games are really good at it where like if you unlock one of the unlockables is you unlock these dioramas of the characters so you can get a really good look at them and, and see see how they work and all that um i also really enjoy looking at other people's character models there's one called uh clementine by a guy called uh, nasa was taken and it's just like a, a sci-fi character and you can inhabit them and then run around it's just an empty space they haven't built a level around it or anything it's just this character but it's just cool to see one of my favorites was a uh, tyrannosaurus rex model by dave138 and it's just a realistic t-rex model who can jump and roar but my favorite thing about it is you can wave his little arms just by pulling the triggers and it looks really goofy and stupid but it's funny uh there's a robot called bt8 by soft 473 and again there's nothing else to it but it's very well animated it's just like a third person shooter kind of camera over the sh- over the shoulder type deal but it really feels weighty and good to control and i feel like if that can be then translated into a proper game it's going to feel solid and feel 
like heavy, which um, which is really good. All of this is super impressive, uh, but it's early days. The game's only been out, f- well, for real since February. It's been in early access for like about a year now, I think, maybe just under a year. Um, so there's definitely uh, definitely a lot more a lot more to come. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see because I mean it's a it's a new set of tools for that they've just thrown out there and there's so many creative people out there on the internet who might not have an outlet and I think that you know the more that time goes on the more that they'll be creating stuff and getting influenced by each other as well and then and then eventually the community will just like grow and and you might get some absolute gems come out from it and that's and that's where the beauty of this type of thing is right yeah exactly it's just if you can have an idea and you're willing to work on it enough and, and work with other people on it because collaboration is hugely important. You can create it. Like, I've got loads of little ideas, but I'm nowhere near as good enough at any of the tools to, to be able to realize them yet. But it's it, seeing all of this stuff is really inspiring. But then some of it is really intimidating because it is so good. It's like, how can I create anything like that? I'm not artistic. I can't do this. I can't yeah. do that. But the game's really well tutorialized as well. Once you get past the art stream thing, which is showing you what you can create it then shows you how to create it um and the, that's made uh, it, it's um shown as basically puzzles so it's like get your character from a to b and we're going to tell you this solution so build a bridge between this point and this point walk your character across okay now i'm going to teach you how to clone it okay so clone it and put it in the next spot awesome okay now build a small thing and stretch it okay next now we're going to make a draw bridge which has a button when you hop on it it will then swing up and then you can run across now we're going to tell you to take away that button and have it on a timer so that it adds a little bit more tension as you run across i think it's a really great way to teach people how to do it because it's making you find the solution to the problem and again yeah. some of them are, are much easier than others um but it, the whole way through these tutorials there's a little video in the corner which you can pause uh, restart rewind fast forward and skip onto the next step whenever you want and it's always there so you can just do it live it's like having a youtube video open next to you but it's already in the game so it makes things much easier cool but there is a very very steep learning curves with some of these tools especially sculpting which is probably what a lot of people will be most interested in because that's how you make your characters or your models mm-hmm. look a certain way but it's very difficult to get the hang of but once once you get there based on what, everything i've seen you can do some really really impressive stuff and as i say some of what people are creating is like how the hell am i ever going to create that with sculpting my biggest concern with it at the moment it's nothing to do with its difficulty or learning curve because that's just something that comes with time and practice like learning any new skill it's the amount of copyrighted material and content that is on there. There's a lot. There's loads of Mario's. There's loads of Sonic's. There's a really, really good Fallout uh, recreation. There's a bunch of SpongeBob stuff. Uh, a bizarre amount of Wallace and Gromit stuff, which I didn't realize was still popular, but I love me some mm-hmm. Wallace and Gromit. Uh, the, pro- the problem is that's all copyrighted. So Media Molecule needs to figure out, and I'm sure they are trying to figure out, what they're going to do about it before companies like Nintendo or Disney come and knock in and they're just like, nope, you're going to have to Shut rip all, all that down. down. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, and ideally, you would be allowed to continue to produce this copyrighted content because a lot of people you know, love these projects. It's like, oh, I want to make a uh, injustice type game like a fighting game but with marvel characters instead of dc i mean it's a tricky one like because it's like how much how much is it actually just art because they're not selling it they're not Mm. um it's they're not financially benefiting from this these creations as creators they're just making something it's like drawing a painting like how how much can you own an image of batman for example if you paint batman do you own that the rights for that you know can you are you can you show that to the people? Is that legal? I mean, uh, at what point do you, do you get sued? It's the same with this. It's a different medium, of course, and there's uh, different nuances. But it's like, at what point do you have to step in and, um, and think, well, you're exploiting our IP now. Uh, you're making money off it. And I think that's where the definition might be, right? If they, if they, in any way they seem like they're losing money because of it or the other guys are profiting yeah. off their IP or the, the name of it, people are buying the game because there's... Um, like X, Y, Z, there's loads of um, Disney content on the yeah. um, user-generated stuff, then that's maybe where the line will be drawn. But it's it's all about terminology. It's all about, yeah. um, per, you know, how people interpret what, what gaining the benefit or whatever well, is from it. And eventually the developers have said the plan is in an ideal world. They're just still trying to figure out if it would even work. Would be that some creations in Dreams would be uh, purchasable and you can pay for them 
uh, through the PlayStation Store. So, like, you create something and obviously it would have to get approved and have to be of a really good quality. That will then get uploaded to the PlayStation Store and anyone, even non-Dreams users, can download it and pay however much for it. But that's when it gets complicated about who owns the IP that yeah. you've ripped off. Although apparently everything you create in Dreams, especially if it's original, not an infringement of someone else's IP, if you create a character called Bob Jenkins in a game called Bob Jenkins Adventure, you, the creator, own that IP, not Media Molecule, which is, I think, right. uh, I think it's a really great, um, you know, uh, point. It's, it's yeah. The, yeah, it's, it's definitely, because uh, we saw the recent thing with um, Warcraft yeah. Reforged or whatever, wasn't it? Where um, all the user-generated content was owned by Blizzard and there was a big uproar about it. But people were like, well, that's how everyone does it. Not in this case, apparently. Yeah, exactly. So altogether, the, I've barely scratched the surface of what this game can do and what other people can create as well. Uh and it's essentially the ultimate gaming social media platform. It's basically like the YouTube of gaming. Just instead of uploading videos for people, you're uploading games and other creations. And it's games and other stuff created by gamers for gamers. And especially at the moment, it's not for profit. So you can just punch out anything. A lot of stuff on there is shit. I want to make that clear. Yeah. There's a lot of trash and a lot of just rip-offs and things that don't work. But that only makes the stuff that is good shine even brighter yeah it sounds a lot like the steam store yeah. to be yeah. honest exactly <laughs> There's a lot of shit on there but there are some absolute gems on uh, on that note just before we move on to the podcast questions steam are doing like a you know they um i think it's gdc was cancelled right so they've got like 50 currently yeah. until monday they've got 50 free um, to play demos like to, so you can trial 50 games that are in production right now on steam if you can head over there it's not very well um Publicized. I can't see it on the main store. I sort of found it through an article, which is a bit weird. But anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in there. Like 50 free demos to try until Monday uh, for those of you who are interested. Some of them look really cool. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, we are going to move on quickly because we are running out of time quickly um, to the podcast questions. Now, these are questions put to us by our Patreon community over at patreon.com forward slash pretty good gaming. And in return for supporting us on this content that we bring, literally without whom we couldn't continue to produce because YouTube are very very stingy in terms of um, the, re the algorithm and the, and the revenue around YouTube these days. Um, you know, in return for the patronage, you get access to this podcast, you get a bunch of other perks, name at the end of the video, whatever, go, go and check it out, patreon.com forward slash pretty good game. And let's jump straight into the first question. And Cloney99 is asking, due to the unspeakable computer virus that prevents all of us from entering the world of E3, and because Gaz didn't know how to say Black Mesa correctly, <laughs> seriously, listen to GLaDOS. Today's SMK theme is Crazy Computer Girls. So GLaDOS, the genius AI, so the first choice is GLaDOS. Oh, this is Shag, Mary Kill, by the way. Choose one to Shag, choose one to Mary, choose one to Kill. That's in ball. GLaDOS is the first option. The genius AI of Aperture Science, testing your skills and keeping you on your toes by thinking with portals of the Portal series. But yes, she's also probably the Aperture CEO secretary who was uploaded onto a computer as an experiment. Second option here is Adjutant the faithful supportive AI of StarCraft fame, always there when you build something new and su supervising the torture of whatever is killed in the science labs. And lastly, Shodan, the megalomaniac AI with a god complex who had a moral restraints completely removed to cover up some CEO's corruption. I always knew this is how the world would end. Uh, and Shodan's from System Shock. Uh, so Cloney's answers, I track Shodan because she's crazy and I always want to make love to an all powerful AI. <laughs> I'd give the, the stick, give the stick to an adjutant because she doesn't have half, she doesn't have a lower half and there are way hotter women in the StarCraft franchise. And I'd marry GLaDOS because GLaDOS is the best girl and I know Gaz is a visual guy. Here's some, I can't, yeah, he's left some other pictures which we're not going to show more, on the uh, NSFW. <laughs> Um, um, so there you have it. Do you have answers for these? I mean, this is what this is possibly the most bizarre uh, we've uh, ever had. More bizarre than the than, than the men we had to choose from last week. Yeah, but at least men are real. <laughs> these are robots. <laughs> um, I think the the one that looks closest to a human is Adjunt um, from StarCraft. So I guess that's the uh, the Shag one. I mean, it's still a robot, but at least it looks closer mm. to a human being. Um, got no, got no lower half, right? None of them do, though. 
uh, Shodan yeah. is just a face, and um, Glados is upside down. Right. I think I think I'd marry Glados because uh, um, she's just fun. I love her sense of humor in Portal. I haven't played mm. Portal Two, but I played Portal One. I think she she's a crazy homicidal maniac, but she's a laugh. And I think she's fun. Shodan's getting the boot. I mean, she's just a big old face. Yeah, I, I can cope with you on that one um, because we are running out of time. So let's <laughs> let's nail their answers in and thank Cloney for his question and move on quickly. Okay, next up is Lochgar. Has producing a video on a nearly daily basis for over two months taken a toll on either of you? Well, I think you're more um, uh, more likely to answer this question because you've been doing the daily ones more than me. So has it um, taken a toll on you? Have you you find it a grind now? You're doing the daily triples most of the time. Um, not really. I can't, I kind of like having the routine of it uh, at the moment. Mm-hmm. So it's normally the roundup on Monday of whatever happened over the weekend, then daily triple Tuesday, Wednesday, then uh, podcast on Thursday, so when we record it on Thursday, um, and then another feature video. Friday. Yeah, feature, feature Friday. My, the only problem with it is that if I ever want to do something else... Um, I've got to work on that. Like, Hard to squeeze I'll, it in. Yeah. Stretch, stretch in a bit of writing here and there where I can, and it can make it a bit difficult. But I, I'd, I like having the routine of it. I like knowing what I'm doing yeah. every day. It's pros and cons, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, we, we could tweak it a little bit, and you could just work on something specific on a Tuesday. But it's like, you know, what's your preference? We, yeah. we, we, can, all, we can always um, adapt, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your question, Lochko. Cloney99, I saw a video on shotguns this morning and how satisfying it is to play with them in video games. I must say, I agree, shotguns are among the most fun weapons in gaming. Yep. Question is, what is the most satisfying weapon you ever used in gaming? Most satisfying weapon? I mean, shotguns always, always win. In whatever, whatever game I'm playing, I'll find the shotgun and, and try it yeah. out. The Doom shotgun is is iconic in in that franchise, and I feel like that's what made shotguns cool. Uh, most satisfying weapon. There's there's something uh, poetic and magical about chainsawing the fuck out of someone in Gears of War with a lancer. And mm-hmm. uh, going back to older conversations about making my girlfriend play it, watching her chainsaw someone. She's not a gamer at all. She's not even really into any of the violence or anything like that but watching someone else chainsaw someone for the first time it's like watching baby take their first steps you know it's, it's beautiful <laughs> it's, it's glorious it's a moment. yeah <laughs> my answer will be the shrink ray from the outer worlds like just to watch like the big praying huge praying mantis thing just shrivel up into a small baby little thing that's quite satisfying so i'm going to use that yeah, as my answer good one. today uh, is it me now? Okay, next up, uh, yep. Metal Shark at Henry with the with the homebrew flu. Have you managed to persuade Larissa into another Gears title, or do you have a more adventurous co op slash versus game in mind? Um, we play. We started moving through Gears Two recently, and we we're almost there, which we haven't we haven't carried on with it. Unfortunately, we just need to need to get on with it. I've been playing other stuff. There's no way a versus game would ever work because she'd get mad at me killing her, but also really, really cocky if she ever killed me. So it would just be unpleasant for everyone involved. <laughs> um, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, <laughs> you you sulking. Yeah, I'd I'd give <laughs> up and just like, oh fuck this. Uh, but the goal, because we played Gears Three Horde uh, a couple of years ago, and we got to like wave forty eight, and then we we're like, fuck it, we we died. We're not doing it again. But the goal is to. Uh, work through all the Gears titles and then eventually start on Gears 5 Horde because it's the best version of Horde Um, because again I think I got to wave 49 and then I think a bunch of my team dropped out and we almost did it and it was a just complete disaster Um, we all died within like five seconds of each other but yeah that's the goal eventually we're going to get to Gears 5 Horde and it's going to be amazing because hopefully by then she'll be able she'll be confident enough to really hold her own because she's she's getting there she's getting there she's getting there baby steps say Um, next up is Cloney's question again. So I stopped I stopped leakage in my water cooling system today. Ouch. And ripped out all my cables, short circuited my PC at startup after plugging everything back in simply by installing an SSD hard drive because my life is hell and my case is too small. What acts of heroism have you performed on your favorite child? <laughs> the PC. <laughs> Uh, that's specifically at me. And what horror stories have you heard that Henry can look forward to in his adventures in the PC Master Race? I mean, I think water cooling leakage is one of the worst things. I mean, you, you, what last thing you want to put in a PC with all that electricity going on is a water system <laughs> just to cool stuff down, right? And if that starts leaking, 
you you can you, you know it's it's bad times that's for sure. <laughs> um, so I I haven't really um, I haven't really performed any acts of heroism on my uh, bills because I I tend I tend to when I get a PC. I tend to just list the things on a website and get someone else uh, Leave it to, to the build it for me. Uh, I mean, why why put myself under that stress, man? It's a lot of money to um, to uh, outlay and then just have just fuck it up by getting water everywhere. <laughs> that's for sure. I've never gone for water cooling. Um, I'm not sure I ever will uh, for that reason because I'm just too scared. Um, so thanks for your question, Mr. Cloney. Let's move on to... Rob Lowe's. Okay, yeah, uh, not that Rob Lowe regular question. Not that you need the reminder, but what is your game of the ages? So this is a game question we get every week where we have to say what our favourite game is of a given year, starting from the year we were born, going all the way up. Um, we're now at, um, what, 23 now? I, th- I can't remember. Um, yeah. But we, we, the only stipulation is that you have to have played the game, not necessarily at the time, because who played a game when they were a newborn baby? Okay, so I'm... I'm closing in on on uh, the finish line now. I'm up to 2019. I'm almost there. I've only got one more to do, mm-hmm. um, and there's a lot of games that came out last year. <laughs> there was a lot, and so these are one just the ones I played. Some of them I played more than others, but m- I've played all of them at least a little bit. So in reverse order, if well, this isn't really, it's not really an order. I'm just going to say the main one last. Metro Exodus, Anthem, God, who f- I forgot that game came out last year, Astral Chain, A Plague Tale Innocence, Rage 2, Mortal Kombat 11, The Division 2, uh, Gears 5, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, Apex Legends, Death Stranding, The Outer Worlds, Days Gone, Devil May Cry 5, and Control. And now my answer shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone because I talked about it very recently, but my favourite game of 2019 is the Resident Evil 2 remake i downloaded the resident evil 3 remake demo today so i'm looking forward to playing that after i've edited all this crap awesome. together but uh but yeah resident evil 2 remake I've, I've said what i need to say on that in the past cool we we literally have like three minutes left this podcast we're probably gonna have to um miss out the comments this week i'm gonna quickly answer this one though 2003 was my year i was 22 23 call of duty came out that year and there's nothing else that comes close to that. I played Call of Duty for days and days and months and probably years uh, also until the sequel came out anyway. So thanks for your question, Mr. Not That Rob Lowe. Moving on quickly to the final few questions and then we're going to have to wrap it up after that, after a, a quick dad joke too. Amstel Ailment is keeping most of us at home. Any recommendations to play or watch or read for all the PGG Prony Pistillions Dodgers? And I'm having... People come into the. Can you give me two minutes? <laughs> so I'm just going to two minutes, literally two minutes. Sorry about that. Um, recommendations any recommendations to play or watch? Well, uh, Resident quick, Evil quick 3 remake demo is out. Doom Eternal is out, so I'm going to be playing Doom that. Doom Eternal. Um, or if you're cl- inclined, Animal Crossing, right? Animal Crossing as well, if you, if that floats your boat. I know Assassin's Creed go. Odyssey is doing a free to play weekend this weekend, so there's another one. That's cool. And the demos on uh, Steam too. Yeah, Assassins. Second to last question. Favorite rom com. Uh, love actually, love love actually, nailed it. Colony ninety nine. Since we're all trapped, what did you watch on Netflix recently? I haven't started been watching, watching any the um, playing games. What's that one with um, with Lost in Space? That's what it was. What it is Lost, Lost in Space? Watching Lost in Space season two. I, it's, not, it's not my best favorite thing. It's more like a teen sci fi drama thing. But um, we're watching that currently. So that is your answer, Colony. I'm afraid. And that is it. Um, I'm going to do a quick dad joke. I'm sorry about this, guys. It's time for the dad, bad dad joke of the week, by the way. And there's, there's your little jingle. Um, so, did you hear about the guy who invented the knock-knock joke? No, I didn't hear about the guy who invented the knock-knock joke. He won the Nobel Prize. Ha, ha, ha. Excellent. Um, I do apologize for how quickly we have to be today because my girls are waiting to come in to rejoin the classes. I'm literally halting their education right now because they're, they've got uh, desks ready to join their online classes right now. Um, but that's it. Sorry, no comments, no YouTube um, triggered fanboy comment of the week this week will be better next week i promise sorry about that we will see you again thanks for sticking with us and sticking through all that you know what's going on with the world you know it's a it's a scary place but we're we're mucking down and getting through it and um with that in mind we'll see you again in the next video until then bye for now